So welcome back to the, seven, the second part of the presentations, the afternoon part, which is going to focus on exhibitions and displays. Um, we are delighted to have with us Denise Miro, who is teaching at Columbia University in New York, and she is the co-curator of Black Models from Jericho to uh, Matisse, at the, currently on view at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and it will be on until the end of July. July 22nd, first. And then we will have a presentation by E.J. Scott, who is an academic and curator of the Museum of Transology, which is currently hosted at the Brighton Museum and Art Gallery, followed by Helena Reckitt, who is a reader in curating at Goldsmiths College, and she will talk about uh, feminisms and empowerment. So I'll let you enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. And as Vasilio said, I wanted to speak with you this afternoon about some of the issues that emerged in two uh, black model exhibitions. The first was at the Wallach Art Gallery at Columbia University, Posing Modernity, the black model from Manet and Matisse to today, which ran last fall through February. And uh, this was an exhibition that I uh, served as curator for together uh, as a result of my having completed my dissertation, which I understand in, uh, in across the pond terminology, I should be saying, is a thesis, not a dissertation, uh, at Columbia uh, on Manet and portrayals of uh, the legacy of portrayals of Manet, uh, of people of color, uh, Manet as well as his, uh, his circle. And we were just very fortunate that for a conflation of reasons, that exhibition was picked up by the Musée d'Orsay, uh, greatly expanded, but also more focused, less a focus on contemporary art, although there are some, I think, uh, uh, compelling, a uh, handful of compelling works of contemporary art in the Orsay Show. So I would encourage all of the um, art history scholars who look at history through the lens, through the prism of the contemporary eye to certainly see this exhibition. And that is part of what I want to do today. I myself started out looking primarily at contemporary art, became very interested in the practices of a number of artists, including women artists of color, who were very engaged uh, using various methods and materials and strategies with um, interrogating the canon, so to speak, the historical works that shaped the legacy that they were confronted with as they went through either art history programs or MFA programs if they were studio artists. And this whole the process of uh, interrogating, uh, reimagining, uh, unpacking the various socio-political agendas behind these images was so prevalent in a lot of the work that I was looking at that I made, uh, I followed the artist uh, path and started looking at the historical periods myself and became engaged with those historical periods, particularly the second half of the 19th century through, say, World War II too, with just this unfolding, um, iterative, but also fraught modernity that I uh, discerned in the changing portrayals of the black female figure from this kind of foundational moment of modernity into the present. So that is what I want to talk about today. And what I'll say is that my suggestion is that the evolving portrayal of the black figure especially the black female figure, was not only foundational to modern art, but is a living legacy for global contemporary art as well. And there are many aspects of this legacy. Uh, for this presentation, I focus on Manet and his artistic milieu in the 1860s in Paris, uh, because it produced several images, some iconic, others almost unknown, uh, that continue to resonate for a wide range of post-war and global contemporary artists working in a variety of mediums, uh, methods, materials, and art-making practices. 
Olympia, Manet's Olympia, uh, for example, has inspired arguably a more extensive body of work than perhaps any other 19th century painting. But he made portraits of at least two women of color in 1860s Paris, and the uh, discerning eye of contemporary women artists of color, including here in the UK, were very much engaged with some of those lesser known portraits as well. And so what I um, suggest is that this, this sort of legacy, or patrimony, as the French would say, of historical art um, has inspired contemporary practices of imagining, reimagining, retrieval of lost identities, and um, sorry about that as successive generations of artists forge their sense of the role of the black figure in the visual representations of modernity. Before we, I'm going to take two or three, three or four slides here to just look at some of the historical works that uh, have informed the practice that are of, of a number of contemporary artists that I will then spend the rest of the presentation uh, looking at. And um, as I mentioned, Manet's Olympia, this um, uh, kind of fraught portrayal of modernity. It's a fraught, it's a scene of fraught modernity, period. Uh, both of these figures are in, are portrayed in ways that address issues or raise issues of gender, class, uh, certainly gender and class as defined by art history, as uh, definitive, as central to what made Manet, what made Manet's art modern, but also what defined the modern period that Manet captured in 1860s Paris. My own view, sitting as you are in a classroom 10 plus, starting 10 plus years ago, as this painting inevitably came up in every survey of modern art or even introductory surveys of our history, and I'm listening to the narrative, typically 10, 15 minutes, the, you know, the precedent and the legacy of the uh, Odalisque in Olympia. And I'm seeing two women in this painting. And I believe, as I, I, I was initially um, um, bothered, but also curious as to why, for the most part, absolutely nothing was said in any of these lectures about the second figure in this painting, uh, the maid figure. And I set out to try to understand, well, is there anything to say? Does the archival record reveal anything? And that is what kind of began this entire project for me. And the two things that I will point out and that we will later see contemporary artists engaging with is that even though this woman is portrayed as a servant in a scene of sex work, there is a fraught modernity uh, about this portrayal. And it becomes most evident, I think, in direct juxtaposition with this very finely painted uh, uh, Orientalist work by Jerome, the master of the style of academic painting. That was the predominant mode of portraying the black female figure in academically sanctioned uh, 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 practice at the time of Manet. And we see in the Jerome, even though this is a few years after Olympia, I selected it uh, because it's just one of a, he made this type of work for over 20 years. And the portrayal of the black woman as exotic, um, as in a scene of, you know, feminine, uh, the work of women, uh, perhaps paid, perhaps enslaved, um, but s firmly outside the, uh, the, um, the, the locale, the location of European um, culture. This is a scene of empire. It would be located in a country. Imagine some combination of imagined as well as some kernel of perhaps uh, ob observed realism. But located in a country that would have been part of the French uh, empire at that time. And the attire of this woman 
gorgeously painted virtuoso display of all of the you know uh, capabilities that a painter had to demonstrate in order to uh, to be seen as an accomplished painter the contrast of textures and colors etc but that attire is something that has nothing to do with the everyday life that the model who posed this painting would have been living in Paris at the time. The bare-breastedness, for all kinds of reasons that we can discuss later if you want to, absolutely emblematic of enslavement. Manet himself made a youthful trip to Brazil and wrote about his shock at seeing black women when they were pushed onto the, uh, the uh, auction block at slave markets being stripped to the waist uh, so that they could be inspected by potential buyers. So one of the things that I really think about when I look at his portrayal of the maid figure in Olympia is the fact that he chose not to bear her breasts, seemingly mundane, but absolutely emblematic of his intention, I believe, to pull this figure out of the tropes of exotic in, uh, enslavement, enslavement in scenes of empire and place her in scenes of everyday life in 1860s Paris, this particular neighborhood where he lived in, the Batignolles Quartier uh, of the Impressionists was dotted with uh, these maison clothes where upscale uh, uh, courtesans or prostitutes receive their customers and that is the scene where he places both of these figures. So this kind of transition from exotic to modern is a big part of what we um, think about when we think about Manet as a foundational painter of modern art. So even though this portrayal of this model, Laura, uh, as the maidservant in Olympia, um, and I should mention that part of why I came to feel that this painting was about two figures, um, about the uh, prostitute as emblematic of the gender and class issues that are very thoroughly discussed in the typical art historical um, uh, commentary on this painting, but also about Laura as emblematic of a black presence in uh, the Paris of Manet's time at an historical moment that was 15 years, just 15 years after the final French territorial, uh, fr final French abolition of territorial uh, slavery. So the fact that he is pulling her into the foreground here, uh, setting her up not in the sort of, you know, overtly servile mode of washing and cleaning and dressing her employer, but proffering this bouquet of flowers and in the facial expression seemingly engaged in some kind of exchange with her, uh, as well as the de-exoticizing and the placement of both of these figures in scene of, scenes of modern life is part of what I felt was modern about this painting, but the fraught modernity coming from the fact that he still leaves her in this archetypal role of uh, servitude, domestic servitude, often in scenes of sex work that were by far the predominant mode of portrayal of the black female figure at, uh, during this period. However, I think it's important to remember that Manet made not just Olympia, uh, made not just, uh, that Manet made three portrayals of the model who he identified as Laure. Only one of them comes down to us in most histories of modern art, and that is her pose as the maid in Olympia. But he also made this portrait, for example. He actually made two portraits, including the monumental portrayal on the right here here of Jean Duval, the biracial mistress who of his friend Charles Baudelaire, Baudelaire being the poet uh, many would describe as the foundational uh, um, uh, uh, writer of modern French poetry at the time, who authored the treatise Painter of Modern Life, urging uh, Manet and his circle to turn away from scenes of exoticism and history painting and all of the tropes that were popular in academic circles at the time to go 
out into the streets of Paris in their own neighborhood, roam the boulevards, go into all the nooks and crannies, paint every scene, every aspect of modern life in Paris. So here we have these two portraits of these black women who are um, in more socially indeterminate um, positions. Uh, there is a contingency about what their actual social role is, and this applies to Laura as well. It is also this portrait of Laura, uh, the painting on the left here, that gives us, through a Manet's uh, studio carnet or notebook, most of the information that we have about Laura today. He described her as an tre belle negress, um, a very beautiful black woman. He told us about her, and I should mention, we're going to talk about that term, negress, uh, a little bit in the coming slides. Uh, it is certainly a racially stereotyping and pejorative term, totally unacceptable in usage today, uh, the common usage of, its, uh, of this particular time. He told us her address, which was in walking distance of his apartment near the Gare Saint-Lazare and of the studio where she went to pose for um, her, his three portrayals of her. He also, um, or actually, that is the, the name, the address, Trebel Negress. Those are the three aspects of Manet's own description of this woman, Laure. But his first archivist, Tabarant, uh, published at, in the early 20th century uh, a description of the painting of this portrait of Laure, in which he also suggested that Baudelaire have, may have introduced Manet and given him her address. So these two portraits, I think, uh, get Manet a little bit out of the trope of having portrayed uh, the black female figure uh, solely in that iconic pose of the servant in Olympia, and shows that there was some engagement in uh, the portrayal of these figures as part of his artistic circle, as part of the uh, social uh, milieu of the neighborhood at the time. But still, um, there's absolutely no question that even though Manet made two relatively carefully observed uh, portraits of these two women of color, uh, they typically do not come down to us in art history. Uh, first of all, there's little mention of law. Uh, or of the maid figure, little discussion formally, socioculturally, politically, uh, any, any aspect of discussion, typically none about the maid figure in Olympia. So there is this um, condition that I um, think of as being invisible even when in plain view, rendered invisible not by the artist and not by what could plausibly be proposed as his intentionality, rendered by the constructions of histories uh, written in times of race, uh, uh, empire, and gender ideologies that rendered any portrayal of a person of color, almost any portrayal of a person of color, as unworthy of mention and commentary, and therefore she's ignored even though she's right there before us. There were strategies uh, that rendered the portrait as invisible, even though in plain view as well very closely documented in Manet's own time, given to his only student, Eva Gonzalez, uh, as a study, uh, or as, as a source for her to study. She, in turn, made several portrayals of black women uh, based on this trope, but uh, just not included in the histories of Manet's paintings of the period. To the extent that there is scant mention, uh, it is often described as a study for Olympia, uh, something the late, great Linda Nucklin helped me to debunk almost immediately, because if you look at them in juxtaposition, you can see that she's not wearing the same attire. The pose is completely different. There's no reason to think of this as a study for Olympia. But one of the ways in which this is most effectively rendered, uh, this figure is rendered invisible, 
in art history is the obliteration of her name, even though the artist told us who she was. This painting is still today titled La Negress. Uh, we had it in our New York exhibition. We were very glad to have it there. We had discussions with the owner, owner the Pinacoteca Agnelli in Turin, about possibly looking at other titles that more accurately reflected Manet's own description of this woman. Uh, it's a very involved process to actually change the title of a painting, but we did agree that for purposes of our exhibition, we would enclose in parentheses Portrait of Lar as a proposed title for this image. That, by the way, was also uh, a major subject of my uh, dissertation the entire first chapter, for those of you who are writing uh, doctoral theses, was <laughs> about why this painting should be renamed. Uh, and this renaming project, as you'll see, uh, with starting with the next slide, has been a huge part of contemporary artist strategies in looking at this work by Manu. And I felt really uh, pleased that my colleagues at the Musée d'Orsay, there are th three co-curators at Orsay who, teamed, who uh, joined me in the presentation that is on view there now. And they embrace this idea of looking at all the negresses and the negres and the other uh, generalized, anonymous racial terms that were almost casually, gratuitously, assigned by archivists, by collectors, by you know, registrars in museums to be the names by which these paintings come to us in our history, even though even a cursory look at the archival record shows that the artists knew who these people were, recorded who they were, had correspondence with them. Uh, these people were uh, occupied various roles in society. So one of the things about the Orsay show that I think uh, uh, sort of indexes that reality is the story, the, the renaming by Orsay in consultation with the Louvre of this quite well-known painting uh, by uh, Benoit, which goes back to the beginning of the 19th century, so half a century or so before Manet's um, Olympia. And just the history of the titles there tells the story. It was shown at the 1800 uh, um, Salon as Portrait d'une Negresse. By the late 90s, emerging scholars, including French scholars of color, were objecting to the racially pejorative term Negresse, so it was changed by the Louvre to Portrait d'une Femme Noire. Femme Noire, black woman, that would be the, currently, the current usage for, in French, for describing a black woman. As uh, Orsay, uh, we, we did, I should say, we did not, we started in 1860s in New York, whereas Orsay went back to the beginning of the, of the 19th century. So in uh, acquiring this loan for, from the Louvre and doing a relatively cursory survey of recent scholarship about this painting, uh, came across an outside scholar uh, in a provincial French town who had actually taken the time to go through the artist Benoit's archives around the painting, uh, her household accounts, and came across indications that one of her two servants uh, named Madeline had sat for this painting. So Orsay, uh, the president of Orsay, Laurence Descartes, the new president of uh, Orsay, together with the president of the Louvre, um, consulted and decided that the first painting in the black model show at the Orsay would be the Benoit painting, uh, made recently more famous than ever because it was featured in the, in the uh, Beyonce Jay-Z um, um, video that has attracted tens of millions of viewers to a site specifically about that video uh, on the Louvre site. So this painting has now been named Portrait of Madeline. And from an art historical point of view, this renaming project always retains the previous title, but we moved from parentheses to brackets, thinking that the bracket more clearly removes this title from current usage, from any kind of um, uh, representation of current thinking about the painting. It is left there 
there mainly for historical purposes so that uh, scholars can find what S4200, over 200 years, been referred to by these previous titles. Another portrait, one of the few, relatively few, major male models, black male models of the first half of the 19th century, uh, in our, uh, a, a, a man named, uh, known as Joseph. Uh, this portrait from the Getty, originally known as Le Negre Joseph, the black man Joseph. Um, the discussion we had among ourselves was, why are we using the term black to identify figures of color when we're not using the title white or European to describe all the European uh, subjects that line the walls of exhibition. So the, part of the renaming strategy was to remove these gratuitous uses of racial nomenclature, as you see here. So with that background, that gets us into beginning to look at how some contemporary artists have engaged with this, uh, this kind of lineage of uh, paintings from the canon. And as I said, one of the main issues was the question of nomenclature. And before we look at the specifics of this, I'm just showing you, sorry. An installation shot <clears throat> from the Wallach's exhibition in New York, where both of these paintings were displayed, to give you a sense of scale as one of the, the monumental scale with which many contemporary artists, when they decide to engage with this material, they want to be insistent. They want to work in a way that cannot be ignored. And uh, making these paintings to the same scale as 19th century history paintings was one way uh, in which, in this case, the artist Micheline Thomas chose to work. Uh, but the issue of naming uh, this monumental portrait made just within the last 10 years was her direct reference. She actually had come across the portrayal of Laura as a portrait by Manet. So she is making this image of this, you know, um, this gorgeous, uh, self-confident, um, sensuous, but fully in control of her sensuality, black woman of the early 21st century. And and she includes the model's name in her title, but she also uses the subtitle um, in Trey Bell Negress in direct reference to Manet's titling of uh, the model uh, Laura in his portrait. A French, uh, young emerging French artist, Elizabeth Columba, was also intrigued by Manet's uh, description of Laure in her practice, which in evolves, uh, involves making a series of paintings. She talks about having grown up roaming the Louvre and her eye drawn to the occasional portrayals of women of color that she uh, came across. And her curiosity to try to imagine well, first of all, just kind of noting, as I said, that these are often very archetypal portrayals. They are typically in positions of domestic servitude and often in scenes of sex work. And many of them uh, exoticized and othered by the strategies of Orientalism, et cetera. Her curiosity was to try to imagine the lived experience of these models. So here we see her uh, portraying, uh, constructing an imagined scene of uh, uh, Laura of Olympia as she walks through the streets of Paris on her way to Manet's studio for her job, her paid job as a model posing Olympia. And uh, this is in the format for those of you who are 19th century French, um, scholars of 19th century French painting of Caillabat's uh, Rainy Day. Uh, it also has several kind of uh, 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 indications uh, of its tie to Olympia. We see the man in a carriage carrying a bouquet of flowers. He presumably is on his way to the studio or to the actual um, scene portrayed in Olympia. We see the black cat 
but he's together with a puppy, a dog, the different connotations of the cat uh, and sexual promiscuity, but also the puppy, the dog of fidelity. Um, and then in the background, there's an ornate portrayal of the wrought iron gates of the Parc Monceau. Manet's studio was near the Parc Monceau, and this would be a 15 or 20 minute walk from his residence, which was about five minutes from this Rue Ventimiglia address where Laura lived. And in a tire that a young woman who would certainly not be a member of the bourgeoisie, a working model, would typically have come from a working class background. Uh, she might have been a shop girl or a waitress in a cafe. But trying to imagine her in her own life, uh, in scenes of everyday life that go beyond the archetypes that she was paid to pose. Thank you. And then uh, we have Ellen Gallagher. Uh, working kind of with a double legacy. Uh, I'm showing you again the monumental scale here of uh, her painting in juxtaposition with Nicolene Thomas, but also the materiality of her work where she is um, uh, showing a projection uh, onto a blank wall that has been appliqued with gold leaf. So working in a very modern contemporary uh, mode of art making to convey this scene uh, of, of from, made from a photograph of Matisse with one of his Orientalists, Odalisque, but she places her biracial face in the place of the Odalisque face, and it is she who is looking at Matisse, whose head she has replaced with Freud, to just begin to visualize the type of um, uh, unpacking of all the agendas behind this pose that she talks about in some of her essays. Jean Duval herself was the subject of several artists of deeply engaged contemporary practice. Here we see Lorraine O'Grady, uh, a venerated uh, Afri uh, African American woman artist now, who juxtaposes Baudelaire's sketch of his mistress, Jean Duval, who was portrayed by the man, in, who appeared in a Manet portrait, uh, with a photograph of her own mother at the age of 33, close to the same age that Jean Duval was known to have at this time, to just address the transgenerational issues of the young woman of Caribbean ancestry, O'Grady's family is from Jamaica, coming into the metropole and all the issues of race and class and gender that she engages with uh, that are similar today, even still today, with the issues that Duval dealt with. Uh, there are a number of others here. I'll just show you uh, Maud Salter, a uh, black British artist who tragically died uh, young just a few years ago. And here she is conflating her interest in both Manet's Olympia and uh, 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 his portrayal of Jean Duval by imposing a Nadar portrait of a model who's sometimes assumed to be uh, Duval, no uh, archival, uh, not conclusively though, uh, in the face, as the face of the servant Lar. And it is, uh, however, rather than uh, she has reversed the gaze so that Laura is not looking at her employer, this woman of color is engaging directly with the viewer. And we see this conceptual photographer, uh, Maud Sulter, inserting a self-portrait in the lower left corner there, shown from the back uh, of herself gazing uh, at the museums along the banks of the Seine during a boat trip that she took to just uh, connote the fact that for her, uh, her muse was the history of art, the exclusionary histories of art that were presented in those um, galleries. Thank you. And, but you know, there are just so many different portrayals of um, uh, remakings, reimaginings, deconstructions of the, uh, the Odalis figure of Olympia. And just to flip through a couple here, we have the Ethiopian uh, artist uh, Awol Ariskul going back to the country of his birth and trying to strip away all the Orientalist fantasy, the ornate interiors, et cetera, and showing the bare bones 
economic necessity that is the reality of sex work uh, for uh, women like this woman. He's changed her name to protect her. This is still illegal in Ethiopia. But he is just, you know, getting back to the idea of the, the just the economic necessity uh, that these women were confronted with that led them to this kind of work. No romanticized fantasy. Um, uh, uh, Congolese artist, M.A. Mpan, is using chips of plywood, the building materials of inexpensive uh, uh, housing in the Congo to portray the Alalis as black. Uh, the maid is European. Her bouquet of flowers resolves as a uh, skull to connote the uh, toxic economic exchanges between the two continents that these women personify. And of course, this trope of you know placing the black woman in the position of the Odalisque goes back to the 1960s, Romeo Bearden, the era of black is beautiful, uh, black, uh, black pride, placing uh, the black woman uh, as a composite figure, pulling from Egyptian art and African mask, but surrounded by African American folk culture of the patchwork quilt in the exact position which he described in his writings of uh, Manet's Olympia. Faith Ringgold, African-American artist, Joe Baker's birthday, imagining her as the Odalisque we see in a painting by Matisse, who is himself in turn looking at Manet's Olympia. There was some formal. There were artists who looked not so much at the content, but just the formal construction of modernity in Manet's Olympia. And this is an ex example here. He eliminates the subjugated gaze of Laura looking at her e employer and the uh, prostitute meeting the uh, viewer's gaze by eliminating their faces and just showing through these uh, black uh, details here the way these three compositional elements are tied together to construct the, the pictorial flatness uh, that comprised the modernity that Manet was instrumental in ushering into the way we think about what it is that makes modern painting modern. My final uh, slide is actually what you see, the first thing that you see if you walk into the Orsay today. It is a uh, site-specific installation by the American artist Glenn Ligon. It is called uh, Some Black Parisians. And on monumental scale here, place at the very center. This is what you see walking into or say, and very importantly in terms of this choice of placement by uh, Laurence Descartes personally selected this spot. Uh, all of the people who are walking into or say, heading to the back to get those elevators up to the fifth floor, you know, the Impressionist collection, which is what three million people come to or say every year to see, must pass this. And hopefully some fraction of those people will be curious enough to go see the Black Model exhibition and see these forgotten and marginalized figures that like Ligon uh, just in, in absolutely he, his signature work is with text and with li on, a neon lighting. And here what he's doing is taking these names, Lar and Jean Duval and Alexandre Dumas, et cetera, these forgotten figures of black uh, France uh, and putting them up in lights and um, trying to, in this way, injecting into the very heart of the museum's permanent collection galleries this presence that the temporary exhibition attempts to explore. Thank you very much for your time.